Welcome to The Blockchain VC, a podcast about crypto and the digital assets ecosystem. My name is Tomer Federman. I invest in the most promising blockchain startups across the globe. I have more than 15 years of experience in tech. And before I started investing, I was on the product side at Facebook, where I led product strategy and global growth of some of Facebook's major ad products. Previously, I also lived in Silicon Valley for a few years, where I attended Stanford Business School. You can find me on Twitter at Tomer Federman. Before we begin, please note that this podcast is for informational purposes only. Nothing on the Blockchain VC podcast represents an investment or financial advice. Please do your own research. Also, if you like this episode of the Blockchain VC and want to help bring more awareness to the space, I'd really appreciate it if you can rate, review, and subscribe to the podcast. This only takes a few seconds and helps get the word out. Okay, let's do this. I have a very special episode today. Excited to welcome to the show Arthur Breitman, co-founder of Tezos. Arthur, welcome to the show. Uh, thank you for having me, Tomer. Yeah, absolutely. Kathleen came on the show a few months ago, and I think it's going to be a lot of fun to also get your perspective. So really appreciate you doing this. Thank you. So Arthur, to kick things off, would love to learn more about your background and what you did before you got into the crypto space. Well, originally, uh, my, uh, my background is mostly in finance. Um, I worked at a few large banks, Goldman Sachs, Morgan Stanley, and I was working on uh, market making and African sea trading. Um, and, but my, uh, I would say my area of expertise was mostly statistics and I did a stint at, um, at Waymo, which is, uh, the, which was a branch of Google X that was working on self-driving cars. So I did this for about uh, a year. And in the background of that, uh, Tezos was this kind of hobby project, which grew and grew and grew in importance. And, uh, at some point it became too big for me to, uh, to ignore. And so I, um, I, uh, you know, I, I left my uh, I left my job to uh, to focus uh, more closely on it. Right, and what was your area of expertise again? Uh, statistics. Ah, statistics. So what you built like statistical models at these banks? Yeah, that's right. So I would do uh, a lot of statistical uh, analysis of uh, time series of uh, order books and deriving trading rule from those statistics. Does that mean that you work closely with? traders or the bank or was that more closely with the IT department? No, no, no. So typically I would, you know, the, I, I would be on the trading desk. So there are traders and the job of the traders is uh, oftentimes to monitor the algorithm, try to understand what's going on in the market, um, make sure that, you know, not, nothing is going haywire. You can think of it as, you know, if, um, if, if you're piloting a, uh, if you're piloting a complex plane, Right, the plane is doing a lot of the logic for the pilots. The pilot is not controlling every single detail of the plane. They're looking at the instruments and they're figuring out what to do based on the instruments. And so, even though a lot is automated, you still have the pilot looking at that. And you can think of the trader um, in an electronic trading desk a little bit as a pilot of the plane, uh, you know, trying to uh, get a lay of the land and making sure that um, the plane is flying overall in the right direction. And you know, there's no indicator that uh, indicates anything is wrong, and so on and so forth. And what uh, the quant spill typically is the rules for the autopilot. Right. How did you like it? It's a lot of fun. Uh, it's uh, really interesting. Uh, there's really interesting uh, problems, and you could, you know, you could uh, you you could keep digging at these problems and and, and finding new interesting things about them for uh, for uh, for many years. But at some point, I did want to do something a little bit uh, different. You know, the, the thing was, uh, I, I had uh, quite a bit of interest in uh, machine learning techniques. Uh, and the, the the problem in finance is that a lot of the uh, a lot of the machine learning techniques you might want to throw at it are just simply not going to work because by construction it's an anti-inductive process in the sense of any signals that you can have is basically going to be treated away, and so as a result the, the things that are, the, the, you're very happy when you have a simple linear regression which will give you like a tiny correlation, and that's what you're after and you're after a lot of these tiny things. And most of the uh, interesting research in machine learning and statistics had been uh, being able to deal with very complex, very rich structure with um, not a lot of noise. 
And that's, you know, that's not what you have at all in, in finance, but that's something you might find in robotics, for example. Yeah, I mean, one of the things that I think is really compelling working at such places is just the magnitude of the operation, right? Like the scale, the amount of, you know, money that's flowing pretty much on a single day is just crazy, right? And so I'd imagine that can be quite interesting just from that perspective alone. Yeah, I mean, if you look at the notional, of course, the notional is going to be hard, uh, pretty high. It was traded back and forth. But overall, uh, high-frequency trading is actually a pretty small industry. It's maybe a few billions a year. It's, 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 it, I think it has uh, a disproportionate uh, visibility because it's weird and it's strange and there was a lot of media coverage over it. But overall, it's a, it's a tiny part of the, uh, of the economy. Yeah, that's probably fair. It's, it's very opaque for sure for those on the outside. So I think there's just like a lot of mystery around it and people are wondering how it works and so forth. Yeah, that's the thing. It's like you have a ton, there's a ton of very advanced research that exists in those uh, places. It's just that they don't, they do not publish. Like no one, no, no, yeah. no, no bank, no, no trading desk is going to publish any of the stuff that they do. Uh, whereas I would say in other industries where, you know, you're doing the research is almost also a uh, uh, has a PR component in the sense that you want to attract people who are interested by these research problems, and so you, you publish a little more, but really not at all in uh, in finance. Yeah, it's very different from that perspective for sure. Okay, so you walk there, and then you said like you saw Tezos, and at some point you just couldn't ignore it anymore. What was it about Tezos that? you found so compelling and that really drew you to become more involved? Well, you know, for, for a while I was involved with Tezos and there was not a lot of uh, attention on the uh, on, uh, on project. You know, the, the, the papers came out and in, there were a few fans, but it was, pretty, um, it was pretty scattered. And I think people really started paying attention to Tezos in 2016 um, with uh, two events. Uh, the... Uh, the DAO hack and the Ethereum, uh, but most m- most importantly, the Ethereum hard fork. A lot of the uh, a lot of the things that have been uh, theorized in the Tezos white paper uh, and in, in the Tezos position paper were about the dynamics of hard forks, the dyna- you know the importance of core development teams, you know what what is the economics of hard fork, how these things take place. And how they can be, uh, and how they can be managed, and it also talks about the security of smart contracts. And so, in the context of uh, both the, the DAO hack and the DAO hard fork, and in the context of the block size war in Bitcoin, all of a sudden, you know, the, the, the content of the thesis paper was in the nice, was in the zeitgeist, and people were like, "Hang on, you know, this is actually uh, this, this this was actually a really good call uh, made years before any of this happened." Absolutely, and I think, as I mentioned. Kathleen Breitman, your uh, wife and co-founder, uh, was on the show a few months ago, and I think she mentioned that as well, that during that period, you both realized just how interesting Tezos is and uh, could see the differences versus some other platforms. I guess I'm wondering, for many folks who are in the space or who enter the space around that period, they tended to focus on, you know, either Bitcoin or Ethereum, right? And you mentioned the fork. Yes, there was this big debate around the Ethereum fork. But I guess I'm curious, like, what was it about Tezos that made you say, hey, you know what? Cool, there's these two big projects happening, but we actually want to focus on that uh, lesser known project at the time, Tezos, because we we see something special there what was it was it really like you saw some components that maybe didn't exist in in other platforms or well you know uh Tez- the, the, the tezos paper mentions uh ethereum but at the time ethereum was really uh uh also just uh, just an idea uh it had you know there was no uh there was no ethereum network at the time so tezos is not you know in some sense is more of a uh uh, contemporaneous with the creation of Ethereum, um, it right? That's a, launch, that's a fair point. Uh, later than Ethereum, but it, it's created around the same time. And so I think that neither Ethereum nor, nor Bitcoin addressed the, the type of uh, of questions and problematics that uh, that that Tezos wanted to address. Okay, 
So then what? You started to get involved and, and decided at some point to leave your job and focus on Tezos full-time? Yeah, that's pretty much it. It happened very fast. It's a big decision, though. Yeah, yeah, it was. But uh, you know, there, was, there was so much enthusiasm and interest for the project, I think that, that made it pretty much a no-brainer. And so for folks who might not be familiar with Tezos, can you provide a quick overview of what Tezos is? Sure. So, um, so Tezos is a technology that lets you deploy uh, a fairly generic kind of blockchain, which can change itself. So typically in a blockchain, the rules are set at the beginning. And if you want to change them, you basically need to agree with everyone else. Everyone patches their servers. Everyone just like ruins new code. You don't have to do this with Tezos. And so with Tezos, the chain is, uh, is capable of collecting proposals for changes to, the, uh, for changes to its own uh, uh, rule, uh, rule set. And it's capable of gathering consensus around that change and then applying this consensus on the fly. And so that gives right to a uh, today to a uh, to a blockchain which has been live for about uh, two years, which existed long before that as a testnet, uh, but which uh, now acts as a uh, cryptocurrency and smart contract platform. When was it exactly that it launched? Well, there's a um, there's a, the chain that, uh, that you know the, the the main chain today was launched in uh, June 30th of 2018. Right, so it's been in development for a very long time, and then... The development started around 2014. Yeah, so it took yeah. a few years to develop. And then there was this huge ICO, right? I think you raised, like, the foundation raised more than $230 million at the time, and it obviously generated a lot of, a lot of buzz, a lot of interest. Ever since then, the thing that really I find fascinating is the growth of Tezos, right? Because, you know, let's be honest, right? Most ICOs went nowhere. We've seen a lot of these projects that raised very significant amounts of money. Most of them didn't really take off, at least not yet. And I've found it quite difficult to live up to the hype. With Tezos, it seems like it continues to grow quite a bit. How did you guys build such strong advocacy around the project? So the, the common wisdom is uh, that people will say like, oh, this project's failed because of incentive, because of the way they raise money and so on and so forth and governance. That's a common wisdom. I think it's completely wrong. I think this project, a lot of these projects failed because they were bad ideas to begin with. And regardless of how they were funded, they would not have worked. They were just plain bad idea and Tezos was a good idea. And that's like 99% of it. And it's, I think for people who don't have the, uh, the main expertise um, or who don't have enough like passion for this space, they, it's easy to, you know, it's, it's, it's easy to, uh, it's easy to try to, uh, to sound smart by, 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 by making it about, you know, some, this, this high level stuff but it really isn't. It's about like ideas that make some sense and ideas that make absolutely no sense. And you could tell, you could, you, 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 you could tell, you could tell before, right? You could tell beforehand. So like you're saying, basically many of them were pretty much like a solution looking for a problem rather than the other way around. No, it's not even that. Um, it's that primarily this, you know, these this, this things, uh, they make sense as cryptocurrencies. They make sense as, uh, you know, uh, censorship resistant store of values. They may also make sense as smart contract platform. But in, the problem is that there was a fetish at the time against competition. If you wanted to compete, you were bad. No one, no one dared say that they wanted to compete with Bitcoin or with Ethereum. So when Ethereum came out, they were not on, God forbid, they were not a Bitcoin competitor. You know, Bitcoin is gold and we're going to be oil for the gas for powering the smart contracts. Or Litecoin is like, oh, no, no, we're silver. You know, everyone was trying to find differentiation. Uh, you know, I, they, they were trying so hard to squeeze themselves into some sort of, uh, of blue ocean strategy, even though it wasn't it. And so... 
you had, you know, it was, it was, it was hilarious. You had a network like Definity, which was like saying, oh, we're going to be a sister network to Ethereum. What the fuck does that mean? Nothing, nothing. It was, no, it was, it was built at the time as a, I, God knows what they're doing now, but like it was built at the time as a, uh, as a direct competitor, and yet they were trying to say like, no, 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 we're, we'll be a, uh, we'll be a, we'll be a sister network, or, or, or you had, you know, Cosmos saying, we're gonna do, you know, we love Ethereum, we're gonna do a heart spoon of Ethereum, isn't it great? We're gonna all gonna work together. A heart spoon, yeah, because like a fork is, you know, that's pointy, that's dangerous. A spoon is very soft, that's great. A heart spoon means you're copying the entire network, and you, you know, you're gonna try to like completely rob it of its network effect. So it's, it's kind of like. It's kind of weird, and I think Tezos got a lot of hatred because I, I, I never, I never basically like bought in this kind of uh, pretend, uh, pretend uh, care bear. Oh, we're all going to work together, and there's going to, you know, net, net 200 networks bloom, and they're all going to exist because it doesn't make sense, and this is fundamentally a winner take all type of situation. And so, because of that, because of that situation, where you know, if you were to be building a layer one project. You somehow I have to make like some sort of um, of reasoning for why you were actually complementary with everything else, um, and then you had people who were building other type of uh, uh, of token, and they were like, no, 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 we're going, you know, we're going to provide some other form of service, and our service is going to be oriented around a token, and the economics around that made no fucking sense. It, they were building open source software, and it was kind of like having a. Uh, uh, a turnstile, you know, like a, a paying turnstile in the middle of an open field. There was no reason whatsoever to expect this to work because this project did not need a token. They were not a cryptocurrency. They did not need a token to exist. And, you know, with very, very few exception. And they tried to shoehorn tokens into things that didn't make sense. And that's why that, that's that's why they didn't succeed because of the, the, the whole thing didn't make any sense. What's the, the economics of the thing didn't make sense. But everyone... Everyone and their mothers were, were, were enamored with this. And they were like, oh, this is so great. This is so much better than cryptocurrencies because cryptocurrencies, you understand, you know, it's this weird thing because cryptocurrency is, is very subjective. It's, it basically um, derives its value from network effect from, from, from people describing value to it. So it's, it's, it's based on, on mythos and it's based on, uh, on, on social expectations. It's, it's, it's based on a lot of things. And instead... Uh, you know, but 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 the smart and 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 the savvy people because they were looking at uh, at um, app coins. App coins was a big thing, and that was completely stupid. And I was happy to say it, and it it, it got me a lot of scorn for uh, for being open about it. But I think it, I think that was dead on. Really interesting point you made here. I want to focus on a couple of things you just said. How did you guys position Tezos? So you mentioned like a lot of the other projects try to view themselves or position themselves as being complementary to, you know, Bitcoin and Ethereum. How was your position and thought process different? Oh my God, you, you know, I, I, it just reminds me um, because Tezos was, Tezos has a big governance component. And so people were saying like, oh, is Tezos a network that's going to be used to do governance for the other networks? Like something that made no, like strictly no sense because a block, you know, a, a the only thing that has sovereignty of our blockchain is itself. Blockchain, you know, can only enforce rules about itself. So, like, no one could just like start a. Uh, I, I, you couldn't just start Tezos and, and say like, oh yeah, <laughs> here's Tezos. And by the way, you know, all all of you other blockchains, you're now under the governance of Tezos. That makes no sense. And people were still trying to shoehorn it into that because they were so desperate, so desperate to think that it was going to be something different and not something that was going to compete. Um, and so the way that it was positioned was basically, you know, cryptocurrency smart contract platform, because being a smart contract platform, make your cryptocurrency a better cryptocurrency. And that was, that, that, that was the type of application that Tezos was supposed to, uh, to power and, that, and, 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 and the one that it does today. Right. So in your mind, basically you thought of it as like a direct competitor to Ethereum. Here's the thing. I also, I think that Ethereum is a direct competitor to Bitcoin. And, really? And, you think so? I mean, isn't it, the use case course. a bit different? No, it's exactly the same use case, Ex except you have two cryptocurrencies and one can do smart contracts and the other one can't. That's the difference. But no, it's not. And and this is a uh, this is and and now I think people are starting to realize it, but they're absolutely not complementary. 
And I don't think that both will... I, I, Why I, not? Here's how, here's how I think about it, right? I actually think the, the use case is quite different, right? Because I think about Bitcoin as this store of value, you know, digital gold. Mm-hmm. And then, yeah, I think about Ethereum as this smart contracts platform, right? That has these capability that, you know, frankly, Bitcoin doesn't have. And is probably you know, more geared towards the mass usage that we see right now, right? Whether it's with stable coins or just powering a DeFi ecosystem. I'm glad you're thinking that. But the fact that you're thinking that means that Ethereum basically shot itself in the foot in terms of narratives by trying to differentiate from Bitcoin. Because now, I, you know, they've been trying to walk it back. There are voices in the Ethereum community that are trying very, very hard to walk this back. Uh, you know, like you look at on Twitter, Ryan S. Adams, for example, he's that's, that's physically his beat. Um, they're trying to walk it back because they know that fundamentally these networks work as cryptocurrencies. And they're trying to they're trying to walk back the idea that no, 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 it's just gas. But it's but it's really tough because now in people's mind, it's like, oh, it's different. No, of course, of, of course, Ethereum is not. It's, it's something different. Um, but the reality is that Let's say that you had you only had Ethereum. Would you invent a version that didn't have smart contracts and say like, oh well, that one will be a cryptocurrency? Yes, I would say yes because I actually think one of the strengths of Bitcoin is its simplicity. Right, it's very straightforward. Smart contracts is an amazing concept, and I think it can fuel basically the next generation of financial instruments and economy. But on the other hand, I think the beauty about bitcoin is just that simplicity right and the fact that it's so secure and can serve that digital gold purpose so again i kind of tend to think that they serve different purposes by the way with regards to ethereum you know once eth2 launches right and you have that staking capabilities i guess more similar to what tezos has already in place you can either it's for gas or just for pure staking yeah, but that, no, I'm, I'm sorry. I, I, I completely disagree with that point of view. Completely. That's, <laughs> That's great. Like, if I had to define, you know, my, my, my view on this is like complete disagreement with this. Um, basically, uh, so first of all, it's true that if you have more complexity, you have more attack surface. Uh, like some, uh, like uh, some strong Bitcoin proponents have made the argument that oh, it's better not to have smart contracts because we don't have this attack surface, and that makes us safer. And I think it's a flawed argument because even though you do have a higher attack surface, you don't have, you know, at, at some point you're able to actually uh, get a lot, uh, uh, make sure that it's secure with a high degree of confidence when it's been running for a long time, when you've had enough eyeballs look at it, when you've had enough analysis of the code, you get to that point. And at that point, it's, you know, when, once you've done all of this, um, all of this vetting, then you you know you you've paid for that you've paid, you, you in some sense you've paid in uh, in uh, in sweat for that functionality but now it's there and you can rely on it so it's it, it it's not like it's an insurmountable obstacle to have complexity and it doesn't mean that everyone has to use this complexity if you want to use something like tezos for example and you want to use it just for the type of thing that bitcoin does you absolutely can do that you don't have to use any smart contracts you don't have to use any of the advanced functionality but it's great that you can yeah, but I guess I guess where I differ on that view is that I think most people recognize there's this blockchain dilemma, right? Where you know there is some trade-off between decentralization, security, and scalability. And if you skew more towards one end of the spectrum, then that kind of takes away from the other. You can't basically the point really. You can't be the best on you know on all three. And so like different blockchains try to optimize for different use cases based on these trade-offs, right? And we see it, by the way, with other blockchains as well, right? Whether they're successful or not, right? Like you can take the EOS example where they have delegated proof of stake and maybe that helps with throughput, but then some people argue, well, you know, it's much less decentralized and so forth. Don't you agree with that? Like, are you saying like the blockchain dilemma is nonsense? No, I don't agree with that. And if you, in fact, if you look at some of uh, the stuff I was saying in 2017, I think explicitly said blockchains have very few trade-offs. 
that's one of the things I would say. I do think there is a, uh, I do think that it's there is a decentralization throughput trade off in some sense. You know, if you want to uh, process a lot of things and have a lot of capacity, then it's harder to be decentralized. I think that that's real. I also think that no one is nearly close to the uh, today is is nearly close to the efficient frontier, and so it's a, you know once we are at the efficient frontier where you start having to make trade-offs. If you want to have more throughput, you need to have less decentralization. Then we can talk about that, but no one is there. And so in some sense, what I would say is like for this level of decentral for this level of centralization, EOS could have a lot more throughput than it has today. Uh, and likewise for its level of uh, throughput, uh, Serum could be more decentralized than it is. So no one, and including Tezos, of course, and but but what I'm saying is like no one is close. So Right now, we're still in a, in a. I think everyone is still in the position of making giant leaps, both in decentralization and in throughput. It does. We're not in a regime where it has to come at the expense of the uh, uh, of the other. And and also, just because there are trade offs doesn't mean that there are multiple equilibrium that will be of interest uh, in the world. I think it's quite possible that the world just converge and say, like, actually, this point on the efficient frontier, that's where you know that that's what's interesting. I just wanted yeah, to to be fair to Bitcoin. Uh, like I said, I think if 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 you had a version, you know, if Bitcoin had started with smart contracts, I think that a competitor that said like, "Hey, isn't it great? We're going to remove smart contracts and we'll have a lower surface area will be simpler." I think no one would take that. I think no one would take that seriously. The reason today is that Bitcoin is in the position that it is is not because of the benefits that it has in terms of technology. It's because it's the first one, and like I said, this. You know, the, the, the systems primarily rest on narratives. They primarily rest on social consensus. And just being the first comer is a gigantic, it's a huge, huge advantage that's extremely hard to uh, to surmount. That's, I would say that's, that's, a, that's a benefit. Trying, but, but trying to say that it somehow serves Bitcoin not to have smart contracts, I think is nonsense. I guess we'll just have to agree we'll have to disagree. To disagree. Yeah. Yeah. But it's but it's important, it's important for me because I get frustrated sometimes when I see Tezos being uh, Tezos being judged by the narratives created by Ethereum. You know, in some sense, it, uh, I see like, oh well, you know, smart contract platform need to do X and cryptocurrencies need to do Y, and you know, Tezos was conceived as a cryptocurrency, and it's a cryptocurrency which has a nice ability of having smart contracts. And so that also makes it a smart contract platform. But somehow uh, people uh, are saying like, oh, well, you know, if you can't do smart contract, then we're going to judge you by this standard. But if you can do smart contracts, then all of a sudden you have to have all of the nonsense that uh, that people have been uh, pitching for Ethereum. And that doesn't make sense. You know, just having more, just having, just having the ability to do more shouldn't be held against you. Totally see where you're coming from. I just have a different, I think it depends on what you optimize for, right? So for instance, like if Bitcoin's transaction fee goes up a bit, I don't think it's that dramatic to Bitcoin's long-term prospects of success, right? Because again, most people don't buy Bitcoin in order to use it very frequently. I think with smart contract platforms, again, if we take Ethereum, for example, right? If gas on Ethereum goes up significantly, like network gets congested, suddenly DeFi has no use cases, just completely destroy that, you and, know, use case. And, and, then, and, then you, and then you gracefully degrade to just being a store of value. That's the thing. It's like your worst case scenario is you degrade to having the same functionality as Bitcoin. Yeah, but then like Bitcoin has that proof of work consensus algorithm, which works differently, right? Different components in terms of security, in terms of decentralization and so forth. But again, <laughs> I guess we'll have to agree to disagree. But what I what I do think is also really interesting is is that narrative war. Here I, I do agree with you, right? I think narratives are being developed, they've been cultivated by certain projects and and then you kind of have to basically build your own narrative or, or you die over time, right? Because people buy into these narratives and they put these lenses on and start to think of it um, based on these narratives. So I do think, you know, having a good story that is compelling and fits with what you're doing is crucial. By the way, not just in crypto in general. Yeah, and I think that, uh, like, having a... 
it, 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 it's really tough because I, I, I think uh, narrative, I narrative <laughs> and ideology and it, it's, very, uh, it's very squishy and soft. And there's also a view, I think there's a view that's popular that it's all about the technology and it's not. I think technology is just the entry ticket. Uh, you need to have good technology, but the idea is that somehow someone is going to roll a better consensus algorithm or better technology and change. I don't. I also don't buy that at all, and it's 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 a view that's very popular with some people. But it's not just the narratives, right? It's the use cases. For instance, if you tell me, listen, I want digital money that's going to be the equivalent of gold, just better, right? I think there's something that you need to develop for that, which is quite different than if you told me, hey. I want the equivalent of the US dollar, just that being digital. In my mind, these are two different products with different characteristics, different features that you need to put in place, completely different use cases. Like, I don't think it's all under that roof of cryptocurrency and one project wins it all. I, I, I have the opposite thesis that you can actually, uh, you, you, don't, you don't encounter many trade-offs in actually getting all of these use cases under one roof. Uh, and then it's a winner-take-all type of situation over a very long term. And it's not 100% winner-take-all. I think you can have regional winners. Uh, I think that it's, instead of winner-take-all, you, you see uh, a very big uh, power law, for example, even probably steeper than what we see today. Or in some sense, you know, the, the, the top currency uh, dominates uh, the second one, which dominates the third one even more than, than, than what we're seeing today. So I, I, do, I do believe that over a longer time frame. I would say that you know the Bitcoin maximalists will tell you that um, it's absolutely ineluctable that uh, Bitcoin is going to crush everything else and there will remain only Bitcoin. I don't I don't share that view. I don't think it's ineluctable, but I do agree on principle with the idea that uh, all of these networks are competing against each other fundamentally, and that there's not there's not room for a lot of them. And it doesn't mean you have to be a, you know it doesn't mean you have to be rude to anyone. Uh, it doesn't mean you have to. Uh, to basically start uh, uh, attacking other people or uh, uh, or just being a jerk generally. Uh, I think it's totally fine to understand that there's a lot of people uh, trying to do cool stuff. And for now, uh, they may be uh, uh, fellow travelers. But at some point, you know, uh, at, at some point, it won't be about growing the pie for everyone. It will be about um, who's, more, who's, who's more relevant and who's less. Interesting. That's uh, that's an, definitely an interesting uh, perspective, quite different than what many people uh, in the space think. And if you read the Tezos position paper, it's 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 fundamentally maximalist in its in its creation. Because if you don't, if you just believe that oh, these networks are created just for one purpose, and you know, uh, then what's the problem with just you know, let's just fork everything. You know, why do you why do you need to have a governance process for choosing a set of rules. There's just, you know, there's just a thousand network room and we'll have one fork which does this and one fork which does that. What's the problem? Why can't we just do that? And so... Yeah, again, I think those trade-offs in the core architecture of these projects that, it, that again, is quite different. But listen, like some people do adopt that maximalism approach. Usually, I think it's Bitcoin maximalism, but, but it, it's interesting. It's definitely thought-provoking. And, and an interesting way to think about. So basically, in your mind, you view both Bitcoin and Ethereum as being direct competitors uh, yes. of Tezos. Interesting. Yeah. Then you thought that way all along, like ever since you started uh, developing. Yeah, I, I, I think for me, the intellectual journey that was the hardest was understanding that some people did not think that way. And I've always, it, 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 it's, uh, it's, I have always find, I always find it hard to. Um, like I understand it on an intellectual level, but I just uh, it is very hard for me to uh, to enter uh, on an emotional level to understand like where these people are coming from. If I take this kind of one step forward and and kind of think about the next steps, are you saying, well, listen, Bitcoin right now has no smart contract functionality, and yeah. it doesn't look like it's gonna have one anytime soon. Does that mean you're pretty bearish on Bitcoin? Long term, um, not necessarily because, like I said, it doesn't have it doesn't necessarily have to do with the technology. Um, so if you look at Bitcoin, is a technological improvement over, over gold. It's a huge technological improvement over gold, which means maybe it has a chance of displacing gold, for example, as a store of value, 
uh, as some you know international store value and maybe mean, means of payment because you can actually transfer it far more easily than you could with gold. Uh, so from a technological uh, improvement, you have something that is able to possibly beat the network effect of the incumbent. And the question is, is having smart contract enough of a, of a delta over the uh, uh, over the over the incumbent to uh, to 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 you know to to beat the incumbent effect? And maybe not. You know, it could be it could be that it, it could be that smart contracts are nice to have, but that it's not going to uh, it's not going to make it's not going to move the needle. And that's that's quite possible. Hmm. Okay. Because I thought, like to your point, if it lacks that functionality, which seems to be quite important, right? Again, when when you look at the DeFi movement and tons of development that's happening there, when you look at the development happening on top of Tezos and and other smart contract platforms, like I think if if that's your view, then it's hard to be positive. I would think about Bitcoin. Oh no no no! no I I think there's a very very good chance that Bitcoin wins. Um. It, but I think if it does, it won't be on its technical merit. Ah, meaning it's gonna it's gonna have more features and capabilities that just don't exist right now. No, 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 quite the opposite. I'm saying um, ah, these features are not, are not important. It, I, 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 yeah, it, it could be that those features are not important enough, uh, uh-huh. and that it doesn't move the needle enough, and so Bitcoin wins anyway. That's, that's quite possible. Got it. But then, and in, you know, in, in in fact, if you're looking at uh, that's that. Uh, if you're looking at markets, for example, that seems to be what markets think about Bitcoin. So, it, it's not it's, it's it's not just a possibility; it's consensus. Yeah, well, it's the clear leader right now, and at least in terms of market cap, right? And and just in general, I would say brand awareness. Oh yeah, absolutely. Yeah, it's gonna be really interesting to see how that uh, unfolds moving forward. Kind of shifting gears a bit, Arthur. What's your view on stable coins? It seems like it's gaining a lot of momentum, especially now, you know, more recently with that uh, COVID-19 crisis, I think, funny enough, I think more and more governments are starting to support the notion of stable coins, obviously, their version of stable coins, right, being regulated by the central bank and so forth. How do you think about that? Do you see an opportunity for Tezos developing a stable coin and building on that moving forward? So the first thing is, I, I find, and I'm not, I'm not going to win that battle, I know that, but I find it very sad that people have come to describe what is basically tokenized fiat currency as stablecoin. You know, historically, a stablecoin has always been uh, some form of financial engineering. You know, you, you, you would financially engineer something inside of a blockchain to produce uh, a token Whose value uh, might be stable, and you know, there they were very bad designs for this, uh, and there were better ones, for example, like uh, uh, like MakerDAO. So that that was a stable coin, and the dead simple approach, if you want to, do, another dead simple approach, if you want to do that, is to not bother with the decentralization aspect and just say, oh well, I'm going to put a bunch of euros in a bank account, and I'm going to represent that li- liability on the blockchain, and that's now what people call a stable coin, and I think that's a bit of a misnomer. And then now you're talking about like a central bank creating a st- well they're not creating a stable coin like what, what what does this mean you know there's no stabilization it's just tokenizing something it's just another form of digital money so I find it profoundly weird to call it a stable coin that's a first uh, that's a first thing um, I'm not super interested in uh, in the latter kind of uh, like tokenized uh, of tokenized fiat it's straightforward there's no technological challenge whatsoever to it. Uh, maybe it serves a purpose. So, you know, if it serves a purpose for now, great. You know, why not have that on uh, on blockchains? But from a technological s- standpoint, it, it's, it's extremely uh, uninteresting. Uh, and so, you know, uh, there's a there there are many people tokenizing different kind of assets on Tezos. It's a good it's a good blockchain for tokenizing assets. So, by any means, you know, if, if anyone wants to, uh, if anyone uh, uh, is looking to tokenize uh, fiat and create this type of stable coins, you know, I should, I think they should consider Tezos, uh, absolutely. But on a personal level, it's not something I'm super interested in. I've, I've been working myself on the design of, so now, now you know, now that the battle for the word stable coin is lost, uh, a design called uh, of something called a, I call a Robocoin uh, because <laughs> it's like a robot. It, uh, it basically takes. Uh, 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 you basically have a smart contract that acts on the uh, um, 
on some uh, uh, on some on some financial mechanism for uh, for making something that's not exactly uh, pegged but that's re- relatively stablish. Uh, by the way, I don't think I think the only way you can get a perfect peg is if you uh, is if you do uh, tokenized fiat. If you don't do tokenized fiat, you can do something that's pretty good, but it's not going to maintain a perfect peg. It's impossible. Yeah. So what do you have in mind if you don't peg it to fiat? How do you create some sort of stability? Yeah, so first of all, if you look at something like DAI on MakerDAO, it's not, you know, you might think it's pegged to the dollar, but it's not really pegged to the dollar because it's a stability fee. And so, you know, if I have one DAI, uh, after a while, I get more DAIs. And so, and that's and, and that's been a long time like this on MakerDAO because it was more interest for people to create um, so-called CDPs than they were to actually hold this type of, uh, of, uh, of stablecoin. And so as a result, you were compensated for holding the stablecoin. Now we're in a different regime with DAI, where there's actually more demand for holding DAI than there's demand for creating CDPs. And that creates a situation where they would want to have a negative fee, but their system does not let them have a negative fee. So ideally what you want is you want something that's close to a peg, but that can drift over time. So you create something where the peg slowly drifts. So maybe it starts at one, and then by the end of the year, your peg is 0.98. Or maybe by the end of the year, your peg is is one point or two, um, could be up, could be down, depending on the relative interest between holding, um, holding this ruble coin, and uh, and creating CDPs. I mean, that is back to the dollar, but obviously you use crypto collateral to create that peg. But my, my, my point is that it's not really back to the dollar because. If you look at DAI, what you really should be looking at is, is, is CHI, which is continuous DAI. And it's basically what, what, you, what you do is if you, you just put your DAI in a smart contract, you tokenize that, and you get CHI. And if you see CHI, uh, you know, uh, until recently, you had a stability fee at 6%. And so the CHI peg would change over time. And that's, that's, a, real, that's a real coin. The real coin is CHI, not DAI. And so I would argue that DAI is not actually pegged to the dollar, not in a meaningful sense, at least. You mean because you get that interest rate, then basically you don't you don't think about it. Because I mean, one die is worth one dollar, right? I mean, that's the whole point. Yeah, but that's, be. but that's just an accounting trick. Uh, because it, because it's, because the supply because this change of, the, 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 the change of supply of die so that it will stay at at, at one dollar by giving you more by giving you more, by giving you more die, and of course, and, and that breaks down if the stability fee gets negative. Like what they would have to do is take away die from you. So you know, in some trivial sense, uh, they were early proposal for a so-called stable coin, which were very uh, <laughs> where they were saying like, oh well, you know, if um, if if it goes below a certain value, uh, we'll just remove some from your wallet. And so sure, yeah, you know, you just renormalize every single time you open your wallet, and and there you go. You have uh, your, the value of your coin is stable, but the supply is not. You know, one day you have a hundred token, and the other day you have a hundred ten token, and the next day you have ninety token. So of course, if you do it like that way, it's trivial to have something that's going to be pegged, but that's not a real peg. I, I don't think you can do a real peg. I, I don't think you can have um, parity without convertibility. Interesting. So when you think about the future, right? Let's say like five, ten years from now. Do you see a world where maybe there's a currency that isn't pegged to, you know, the dollar or any other fiat currency that's widely used? Is that... Um, I mean, the euro is widely used and is not pegged to the dollar. Yeah, yeah. I mean, either the dollar or any other, you know, major fiat currency. Like, I wonder if you see a cryptocurrency, like a native cryptocurrency that isn't pegged to any fiat major fiat currency that's being widely used for instance people go and buy coffee with it like do you think we'll get there um i'm not sure i don't think that the uh i don't think that the competitive use case for uh, for cryptocurrencies is buying coffee so mm, maybe maybe not i'm not I'm, I'm not so sure but what's more interesting is that i think you could have robocoins coins which um, stabilize their value with respect to purchasing power and not necessarily to any external fiat currency. Huh, interesting. Okay, how would that work? Okay, so let's say you have, uh, let's say you have a system where people uh, take some crypto collateral and then against that collateral, they mint 
uh, some uh, the mint a, uh, a robo coin for example and uh, and then they use it uh, you might say what is a, how do you measure this you know you, you want to measure the stability of, uh, of your system so that you decide if people need to put more collateral or less collateral and one way you can do this is by trying to compare the value of your robocoin and the, and the, and the value of an external uh, fiat currency and that will tell you if it's stable in some sense you anchor it to something that you know is somewhat stable that's one way to do it another way you can do it is you can look at the total amount of um, you can look at the total amount of uh, collateral that's that's placed. You know how much is locked, and if it's large, then you know that you have achieved that you, that you have something as stable. And the reason why is that people would not want to lock their collateral if you know if, if, this, if the underlying RoboCoin is going to be very uh, very volatile with respect to their purchasing power. And likewise, people that's like you want to hold it if it's volatile. So just by measuring. Just by measuring the amount that you issue, you have an, an intrinsic measure of stability, and that's um, that, I find that super interesting. Basically, you can uh, it means that in the world you could look at you can look at um, at critical markets as a uh, for example as an indication of stability. And I, I haven't seen anyone try to do anything like that so far, but it's uh, it's a possibility. You could also just do it from you could also just do it from governance. You know, you can have users of your system decide that hey, you know what, we think that this uh, stablecoin or robocoin has lost too much of its value, uh, and uh, there needs to be some, uh, you know, there needs to be some tightening or some easing. So you can absolutely do that. Curious about what you said earlier. So when you think about cryptocurrency, where, where do you see the biggest opportunity? And not even necessarily Tezos. I mean, obviously you can talk about Tezos, but I'm just wondering in general, where do you see the biggest opportunity? You mentioned you don't think it's necessarily in buying coffee and kind of use it as a daily currency. Where do you see the big promise of cryptocurrency? Oh, a few things. So I think that the, the one use case that's been really demonstrated and, uh, and and constantly uh, uh, um, present has been store of value, essentially persistent store of value. And it's very hard for people to accept that it is using. If you hold a Bitcoin, for example, if you buy it and you just hold it, every second that you're holding it, you are using it. You're using it as a way to transfer value through time. And, and it's a process called saving. And people don't, we live in a, now in a society which discourages uh, savings in many ways. And so it's really, really hard for people to understand that. But the idea is that you want, you know, you, you have, you want to buy things in the future and you don't know how to transfer value in the future. Maybe you could hold fiat currency, but it might be debased or it might be seized or it might be stolen from you. And the idea that you can hold a cryptocurrency instead that's valuable. It may be, you know, for some people, it may be harder to steal cryptocurrency from them than it would be to steal fiat from them. For some people, uh, it may be much more likely that the fiat will be debased. And so that's an important value. And, and holding is using. And very, very few people understand that. But the reason why, you know, the reason why something like a cryptocurrency, like Bitcoin, for example, which doesn't have any, any cash flows, uh, all of these cryptocurrencies, they're not. They're not claims on some underlying business. They are intrinsically valuable because they have a convenience yield. And the idea of the convenience yield is that you are, in some sense, as a, uh, as a user, as a holder, willing to pay a premium just for holding this. And you can see it if you look at the Bitcoin futures, for example, you'll see the backwardation. And so you can see that, it's, you, you can see that, it's, that there's this convenience yield. Very few people understand that properly about cryptocurrencies that holding is using. So that I think is a very important use case. And yeah, people, absolutely. People, people dismiss it because they are so desperate to find something more more cool than that. But I don't think it has to be. When I talk about saving, explicitly has nothing to do with any type of price appreciation. It has to do with the fact that it's value that is not debased over time. You have one Bitcoin at one point, you're going to get one Bitcoin at another point in the future. And it's not about, you know, and, and the fact that it might go from 300 to 20,000 is, is not a feature. 
it's a, it's a, it's a bug. Ideally, it would have a much more stable, um, uh, it would have a much more stable purchasing power. So you're referring more to the monetary aspects of it and the fact that no one can print more of this and the monetary policy is transparent. Nobody can really change that. But also you can hold it in multi-sig. So you can have safe form of self cult. Uh, you can have safe form of self cult self self custody with Bitcoin. There are very very few assets which are as transmissible as Bitcoin, and that have a form of self self custody. You know, if if you live in a if you live in a country and the country is invaded, and people people could seize immediately your bank accounts. Uh, they could seize your you know they could seize your furniture, they could seize your house, they could seize everything. The one thing that they might not be able to seize is your cryptocurrency. And so, yeah. you know, if you live in this situation, then you don't care if it's going from 20,000 to 10,000 or 10,000 to 20,000. That's not that's not the point. The point is that you still have something. And ideally it would be it wouldn't move as much, but at least you know you you, you have something and 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 you value it despite the volatility yeah i tend to think they're all connected in one way or the other right because of the benefits of it being something that you can't really censor easily because it's so easy to transfer it it's digitally native and and so forth i think the more people get exposed to it the more people learn about it there's more demand right and there's obviously fixed supply so i, I do think that they're all related and 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 by the way, if the price went down significantly over time, like, do you still think it would be a good savings mechanism? If Bitcoin was worth like, you know, 8,000 three years ago and now it's worth 800. It depends on individual circumstances. It depends on everyone's threat model. Like, I think everyone has a different view of what might happen to fiat currencies in the future. Everyone has different views as to what might happen to the banking system in the future. And so... You know, depending on, on on how people think about that, I think that it's not um, it's not necessarily the first uh, it's not necessarily the first criterion, or at least shouldn't be. Hopefully, you agree that it's going to be a much tougher sale, though, if it loses you know significant portion of its value over time. But it can. I mean, it has in a, it has in the past. You, you know, it just just because you know Bitcoin went up at one point doesn't mean it won't go down, and uh, the past doesn't predict the future. Any other um, uh, developments in the crypto space you're excited about beyond savings? I think that was your first point. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I think um, uh, basically having in uh, an internet native form of uh, of payment is also super interesting. So the ability to just set up a website and be able to accept payment immediately from uh, anywhere in the world with a standard that just works, as opposed to having to go through third parties, the the the, the barriers that we move for immediately trying something and monetizing something, I think are huge. And so uh, I think that's also one of the important uh, use cases. Yeah, absolutely. And the third one, the, the third thing that cryptocurrencies are great for is they're great for paying for smart contracts execution. You know, it's like, it's one of the things that you can use a cryptocurrency for, pay for smart contract execution. And so that's why it's so great to have smart contracts on your, uh, on, on, on a cryptocurrency uh blockchain because cryptocurrencies are uniquely well suited to pay for the execution of smart contracts. Yeah, absolutely. From your perspective, Arthur, what's um, what's holding us back from seeing more mass adoption of cryptocurrencies and in particular smart contract platforms, right? How do we go from where we are right now to to the next phase, right? Basically smart contracts being much more widely used. What are we missing right now? I think we're missing a lot of a um, we're missing a lot of good uh, of good UX. I think the uh, in general the uh, the experience of uh, of using smart contract is pretty terrible, and so that needs to get uh, I think that needs to get a lot better before we see much uh, much adoption. I also think that many projects are not trying to solve real problems. So either they are trying to solve real problems that real people have, but problems that don't necessitate a blockchain at all, or they're trying to solve problems that don't exist. And, and there are few, I think there are a few problems which, which do, uh, which, for which smart contracts do make sense. And I, 
I think there's um, there's a type of thing that people don't yet know that they want, and so it's uh, I think it's going to take uh, longer. There's a there's a there's this idea that somehow every technological revolution needs to happen faster because people say, oh well, look how long it took from uh, you know from from uh, mobile from, from from regular phones to cell phones to smartphones, you know, and every single time the uh, the time to adoption uh, becomes faster and faster. But the thing is, is like if you you know if, if if you had a phone and all of a sudden I give you a cell phone, the value prop is super easy. It's like you know you had your phone and it used to be plugged in a wall and now you can take it with you. It doesn't you know it like it enables new uh, user pattern and user behaviors, but it's it's not very hard to. Uh, it's not very hard to explain the the, uh, the value prop. Yeah. And if you have a smartphone, you're like, well, you know your computer. Now you have your computer and your phone. Easy. It you know, so it doesn't require uh, much of a uh, paradigm change. This is more like the introduction of the personal computer, where people are like, what the heck are we going to do with that? And it's and and it takes longer um, because people are not used to it. And this is even weirder because we're we're, we're touching at things. Um, and, you know the idea of money, the idea of value, which have been uh, rooted in humanity for for millennia. Like the idea that you need intermediaries for making payments, for example, that's something that's been going on for millennia. And so, right. uh, changing this is going to take more than a more than a few years. Yeah, I also think like it's so um, sensitive, right? I mean, this is money we're talking about. If you develop an app for whatever, like deliveries or something, if it doesn't work perfectly, fine. But like if I send you money and it's lost or, or, you know, I used custody somewhere and it's, it's gone. Mm -hmm. That's like, you can go wrong there, which in turn means that the people developing these solutions have to do a lot of due diligence and have to be very careful, right? You can't just put something very scrappy together and just like launch it and and then iterate from there. That's not going to work. Yeah. 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 So, Last question before we finish, Arthur. What's next for Tezos? Anything in particular you're excited about? Um, yeah, yes, yeah, sir. So, uh, you know, uh, there are regularly uh, uh, upgrades which are proposed to uh, on the Tezos network, and the participant in the Tezos network can uh, uh, can, can, can can vote to uh, to accept uh, upgrades to the code. And I know there's one that's been in the work for a while, which introduces uh, privacy preserving transactions uh, inside. There's a smart contracts, and I think uh, a lot, of, many people in the community have been excited about that, and uh, it's I, I think it, uh, it's coming to fruition, and so that's that, that's really uh, that's something that's really exciting. Yeah, uh, well, definitely looking forward to that. Again, as I mentioned, I think at the beginning of this uh, discussion, it's really been uh, very interesting to see the growth of Tezos over time. So, so definitely looking forward to see what where you guys go from here. Thanks so much for taking the time out to, to come on the show. Really appreciate uh, you sharing your uh, views and uh, insights. Uh, and I personally just really enjoyed this uh, conversation. Oh, thank you. Me too. Me too. I, it, 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 uh, very interesting because we have very different ideas on... Uh, yeah. On which, that, yeah. Which I find to be the best discussions, right? Because it, it just generates a lively debate about these issues we're, so, uh, we're all so passionate about. All right. Well, thank Thank, you. uh, Thanks a lot, Arthur. Thank you, Tomer. Have a good one. Thanks for listening. If you like this episode of The Blockchain VC and want to help bring more awareness to the space, I'd really appreciate it if you can rate, review, and subscribe to the podcast. This only takes a few seconds and helps get the word out.